Good morning to all and welcome to St. Andrew's United Church Worship. We are coming together on the third Sunday in the season of Lent, and we are also coming together for a special day for Shannon and myself and all of you as we look back on the commitments that were made over the last one and a half and two years, and we look ahead to the changes and the changing commitments that we're making to one another as we continue to journey forward in faith through this season of Lent. It's really good to see all of you in the sanctuary. It's good to see all of you who have joined us on Zoom from your homes, welcome. And let us come together united in the spirit of Christ. As we gather on the, this land, we acknowledge that this place has been cared for and stewarded by many, many generations of people. We acknowledge that the, it is the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek people who have been here coming together for worship, for gatherings such as this, and for daily life. We are all members of the Williams Treaty. And as participants in the Williams Treaty, we continue to strive for reconciliation and for right relations with all our treaty partners. And friends, I'm so used to giving the land acknowledgement from Canmore that, hey, I'm gonna do it again. So friends, please remember, <laughs> The hosts on the land where I live in Canmore, the Ayahe Nakota people, made up of the Bears Paw, Chiniki, and Good Stony nations, and they are signatories to Treaty 7. And we also acknowledge that it is the homeland of Métis, uh, the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. And friends, I am not a person of African descent. But as a person of settler descent, I want to acknowledge the African ancestors. Those indigenous to the African continent, it is important to acknowledge the generations of people of African descent who were forcibly brought to this land and displaced around the world because of the transatlantic slave trade. We want to acknowledge the historic and contemporary resilience of black people of the African diaspora as they have and continue to unequivocally resist oppression, demand for social justice to dismantle oppressive practices, systemic and institutional racism, and make incredible contributions to our society serving as examples of excellence and inspiration we pay tribute to their sacrifice. And I forgot to take off my mask. I either forget to put it on or I forget to take it off. <laughs> <clears throat> so friends, welcome to this time of worship. Whether you come often on Zoom, come often in person, or whether this is a, a visit for you, know that you are welcome in this place St. Andrew's United Church has a mission that includes inspiring faith, practicing compassion, and building connection in our community and the world. And St. Andrew's vision is to be creative and courageous people, empowered by the Spirit to practice love, reconciliation, and justice with authenticity, to be a spiritual home where Jesus' love for all is visible, as we serve a diverse and multi-generational community. And we're going to light a Christ candle. The light of this Christ candle reminds us that we come together in worship with Christ's spirit in our midst, uniting us, from wherever we are, we need Christ's light to guide us into the places and the time that are ahead. And we also share 
the peace of Christ. I invite those in the sanctuary to turn and pass the peace of Christ in whatever wave or smile you find helpful. And those on Zoom, as you scroll through the tiles on your screen, let us share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace. With you. I'm just going to make a few announcements and then Shannon is going to add some as well. All in the sanctuary this morning are invited to stay after the service for a time of fellowship and a time of coffee in the upper hall, straight through these doors and to the end of the hall. Um, it, it, last week, Shannon and I were gifted wonderfully with books that we're going to be using during the Time for All Ages in service this morning. There is space in those books for any who have not had a chance yet to add a signature and your wishes. Uh, so those books will be in the upper hall as we gather after the service this morning if you uh, are wanting to get a chance to uh, leave your wishes with both Shannon and myself. This coming Tuesday, you can come back to the church for the church cafe. I was delighted to have had a chance last Tuesday to be here in a circle of, it was at least 20 people, uh, in enjoying fellowship with not only others in the congregation, but with neighbors, with those who live nearby. So the gathering this Tuesday is going to be a St. Patrick's Day theme, if you have something green to wear, that uh, would be entirely appropriate. I also want to mention, draw your attention to the announcement in the bulletin about sleeping children around the world. Our campaign for 2023 is beginning and will continue throughout the season of Lent. Please make note for all those who are interested in finding out more about it or in making a contribution, uh, the information is in your bulletin on how you can do that. And coming up in your life next Sunday, Yvonne Weston is going to be your worship leader and preacher. I know it's going to be, sorry, Michelle is your worship leader <laughs> and Yvonne is preaching thank you for that and following on March 26th that will be your first Sunday with Reverend Deborah Foster how exciting is that I'm going to go off script for just a moment because I want all of you to know that there is a hot pot of coffee on in our place in Canmore when you come to visit me. And I really hope that if you make it as far as Calgary that you'll take an extra hour out to the mountains to visit me. Please, please do. And another note is that I do the weddings for the United Church of Canada in Banff in Canmore. I do a great wedding. So if you or anyone in your sphere of influence <clears throat> is getting married, um, drop my name and that the Banff and Canmore are lovely places to get married. <laughs> and I'll go back on script. This coming Mar uh, Tuesday, March the 14th, is Pi Day, that is 314. And it, is, it has become a national event in the United Church of Canada where we lift up and celebrate uh, being an affirming congregation. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that, but please take a look at the invitation to take part in um, the special event that's going on on the evening of March the 14th. It looks like it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful event. And now we are going to turn to our moderator, the Right Reverend, uh, I think Right Reverend Doctor, Carmen Lansdowne, who uh, tells us about the celebration of Pi Day this year. Hi friends. The fifth annual National Affirming Pi Day is coming up on March 14th. Pi Day is an invitation for us to reflect on the things that we can do in our communities to affirm people 
who have been traditionally marginalized by religion with a focus on Two-Spirit and LGBTQ plus communities. It's also an invitation to celebrate together and an excuse to eat pie. Apple pie, pizza pie, shepherd's pie, all pies are welcome. Pie is not just a delicious food, it's also an acronym that stands for public, intentional, and explicit. And this year's theme is the Year of Intention. What could a Year of Intention look like for us as we all strive to be more affirming? As I think about this upcoming year, my intention around affirming issues is to be more intentional about understanding the history of justice seeking and promoting respect for human rights on sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. I grew up in a household where there was acceptance and affirmation of the 2S LGBTQ communities, but that means that a lot of my understanding, including my acceptance of my own sexual orientation, was implicit. This year, my intention is to make that understanding explicit. There's so much misinformation that's spread about queer and trans folks and drag performers, and sadly, much of it is religiously motivated. I know that it's not enough to disagree with unhealthy theology, I also want to proclaim the gospel that I believe in and provide another narrative around faith that doesn't involve discrimination. So I ask you, what could you and your community do in this year of intention? I encourage you to have conversations, dream big, and commit to taking another faithful step in the journey to embody the expansive love of God. Oh, and one last intention to share. I also plan to teach my kids to bake pie. Friends, we're going to uh, join in a responsive call to worship, and it is going to be on the screen. It didn't make it into the bulletin. I will be reading the, uh, the light face print, and you can join Reverend Tim on the bold face print. It's also a little bit yellow. Welcome pilgrims on the way to the cross. We are learning to follow Jesus. The way is long, and we are thirsty. We seek the living waters of Jesus. We feel the weight of scarcity warring with hopeful whispers of abundance. We need the living waters of Jesus. We wonder if God will provide us with what we need here and now. As God gives us the living waters of Jesus, so God calls us to quench the thirst and meet the needs of our neighbors. Pilgrims on the way, come, let us worship God. We come to worship God as we learn to live inside out. Amen. Let's come together as we sing number 642 in Voices United, Be Thou My Vision. Let us join together in the first hymn.
Let us come together in prayer as we approach God with our confessions. Let us pray. We thank you, O Lord, for in your loving wisdom you created one human family with a diversity that enriches our communities. We pray to you, O Lord, that we always recognize each member of this human family as being made in your image and beloved by you with worth and dignity. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may envision a way forward to heal the racial divisions that deny human dignity and the bonds between all human beings. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may affirm each person's dignity through fair access for all to economic opportunity, housing, education, and employment. We pray to you, O Lord, that we may have eyes to see what is possible when we reach out beyond fear, beyond anger, to hold the hands of our sisters and brothers. We thank you, O Lord, for your call and challenge to us that we may reveal your teachings and your love through our actions and to end racism and to proclaim that we are all your children, heirs to your sacred creation. Hear, O oh God, the prayers we lift to you in silence in this time of confession. Hear all these prayers we offer, and in your love, answer, O oh God. Amen. The words of our prayer of confession were from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in 2018. The assurance of pardon is from the Episcopal Litany for Social Justice. And now, may the God of forgiveness grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression and that we may fervently use our freedom. Help us to employ in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations of, to the glory of God's holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with God and with the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Now, I know that there are some younger ones in the sanctuary here with us, and I'm going to invite you to come on up to the front and have a seat on the carpet or on the steps. I have brought a book with me. So, Sean, if you want to join us as well here at the front. I actually have two copies of this book one which was given to me last Sunday and the other given to Reverend Shannon behind us. So with the camera on both of us, I'm hoping that those on Zoom and especially any of the younger ones there will be able to see the pictures that I've got. It looks like Sean is going to look on, on the screen for the pictures which are The name of this book is In Every Life, and it's written by Marla Frazee. The illustrations are quite remarkable in it. Uh, there are many more illustrations than what we're going to have time to look at even this morning. But it was inspired by something that happened in church when a child was being baptized. And during the baptism, some of these same words were inspired in the author's mind who heard the words of blessing during the baptism service in the church. So she begins by saying, in every birth, blessed is the wonder. 
And you can see on the page at least 10 different times and places where we can find wonder in every birth. Isn't that a wonderful picture? That inspires wonder. In every smile, blessed is the light. And oh my goodness, we see people laughing together in the wind, and a mom tossing a baby in the air, and somebody hugging a furry friend. Lots of ways that smiles bless us. And oh, there is a wonderful picture of light coming next. Light shining into many places that people find wonder and hope. The next page says, in every hope, blessed is the doing. We move from hope to lovingly showing uh, things that we are accomplishing and learning in all of the pictures on this page. And the big page shows us a long journey up to a, a place of, of, of wonder and doing. In every sadness, Blessed is the comfort. Sadness is a part of life, and we see a number of different places and spaces where there is sadness. Someone is sick in the hospital. It looks like someone is lonely, although they have a furry friend with them. There are some very sad situations, but life brings sadness. And in the sadness, there is comfort. Here's a picture of some people. It looks kind of like a dreary spot, but beautiful at the same time. And they're snuggled up together with a blanket. And the words on the next page say, In every moment, blessed is the mystery. Pictures show us those who know that there's much more around them than what they can see, much more which doesn't always sound or you can hear clearly. There is mystery in every moment. The big picture is of an endless horizon on the beach over in the water. In this page, in every love, blessed are the tears. Sometimes they're happy tears, sometimes they're sad tears, but tears are a blessing. When we win, when we spend special time together as a family when we say goodbye. Ah, blessed are the tears. <laughs> blessed are the tears. In every life, blessed is the love. And that's the title of our book, In Every Life, Blessed is the love with many ways of expressing love and finding love and where love is learned and grows in our experience. And the final page has some writing in the sky <laughs> as friends go into the distance with those who they love and more mystery and love and care and blessing and that is in every life inspired by 
the child's baptism in church. <laughs> Would you like to pray for us, with us? <laughs> Since you're so good at it. Let us bow in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for things that we cannot see, the mystery, the love, things that we know are here through our family and friends and through your presence. Go with us now as we enjoy learning in your love. Amen. You're so good at praying, you should be a minister. Yes, there is a program for the younger ones downstairs. Please make your way with Kendra and Katie. And we'll invite the, uh, the choir to come forward for our Ministry of Music. Thank you. 
Gwyneth's name is in the order of service, but Gwyneth's not able to be with us today. And we added, um, we added some other voices. <laughs> so we're going to do the reading of the Samaritan woman, reader's theater style. Uh, Devisha is our narrator, and B. Villino is the Samaritan woman, and Henry Young is Jesus. So we'll have Henry and um, B. come over here to the mics, and we'll put up another. Uh, we'll put up another, put up another uh, stand. Oh, you've got. Hello. No. So you can stand. Good morning, everyone. I can begin. Wonderful. So um, we will be looking at the story that can be found in John 4, uh, five, verse 5 to 30, um, and verse 39 to 42. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sakar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water crushing up to eternal life. Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Go, call your husband I have and no, come back. I have no husband. <laughs> you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, never on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as this to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. Come and see a woman, sorry, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, Is it no longer because of what you said that we believe? 
for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the savior of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for embodying the words. Friends, please pray with me. Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is such a great story. And if you can get your uh, head beyond the consistently challenging language that the author of the Gospel of John uses all through his book, this story literally drips with symbolism. So I'll try to preach only, oh, I don't know, two, three, or four of the sermons, you know, possibly two dozen that actually live in this reading. What I love most about this story is that we see how Jesus breaks all the rules that get in the way of experiencing the life that God intends for us. In this story, it's important to understand who the Samaritans were. Samaritans were a group of people hated by the Jews. Many generations before Jesus, there was a war that saw the Babylonians invade Judea and where most of the people were either killed or taken into exile. A few Israelites who were not considered worth killing or worth carrying off were left in the area of Samaria. The conquering force settled in all of what used to be Israel and eventually they intermarried with those who were left behind. When the exiled Israelites returned to their homes 70 years later, they found to their horror a mixed race of people who resembled them but had a strange language and odd customs and a corrupted form of the Jewish religion. Samaritans were reviled by the people of Israel and vice versa. And most would go out of the way to avoid walking in Samaritan territory. In this story, Jesus was in Judea and was going to Galilee. And verse 4 says that he had to go through Samaria. But there's no explanation why. Well, perhaps this story is the reason why. So we first see a weary Jesus sitting by himself by the well when a Samaritan woman comes to draw water for herself at an unusual time of day. It's midday, and women who get water generally do this activity early in the morning and at sundown. And usually it's done in a group. Later, we might be given some possible clues about why this woman may have been going to the well by herself at the hottest time of day. And Jesus speaks with the woman and asks her for a drink. Boom. Jesus breaks the rules. Men don't speak with women in public places. This was understood across the ancient Near East. Men and women never would interact with each other outside of the home. So when women would only, women could only speak with male relatives and a husband in the household or in the yard never, ever with a man outside of her family. And he's requesting a drink. So that would mean that he's expecting to drink out of whatever utensils she brought with her, a jug, possibly a cup. Now, Jews and Samaritans did not share space, not any space. So they would not have shared food or drink. They would not have shared plates and cups. So for Jesus to ask a woman to give him a drink of water using her own vessels would have come as a huge shock. If I were her, I would have turned around and gone back home. <laughs> but she didn't. Friends, you've heard stories of a race-divided America where water fountains were designated for white and black people. Black persons had limited places to access a drink of water one of many limits placed on their movements. 
And white folks could not have imagined taking a drink of water from the same water fountain as a black person. They would have recoiled. And I imagine this Samaritan woman recoiling with this man who had the audacity to address her and then have this totally strange request to have her draw some water for him and let him use her cup to drink. She doesn't turn and run. She does ask for an explanation. <laughs> How is it that you, a Jew, ask me a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And with that question, Jesus breaks the next rule. He starts a theological conversation with a woman and has a dialogue, treating her as an equal. Now, he doesn't answer her question. <laughs> in good rabbinical form. Rather, Jesus matter-of-factly says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying it to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And thus starts that a deep conversation between Jesus and the woman that is hardly the stuff of a casual encounter at a well. The conversation swiftly moves from Jesus asking the woman to help him with his physical thirst to Jesus inviting the woman to ask him for the gift of living water, something she's never heard of. And she responds to Jesus' words with curiosity and with wit and with pride in her Samaritan ancestry. At this point in the exchange, Jesus takes the conversation from the theological to the personal asking the woman to call her husband and return. And she replies, she has no husband. Now, this is a strange twist in the story that personally makes me squirm. He'd been speaking with the woman as an equal, but then brings up the male figure in the woman's life. And this gives us a glimpse into the woman's backstory. Jesus affirms that she's telling the truth about not having a husband because he knows that she has had five husbands, and that the current man that she is living with is not her husband. Her tragic story of a string of past husbands suggests that she might have been shunned, likely was shunned, by the other women of the community. And that could be why she's at the well on her own in the noontime heat. Now, interpretation of the story for much of our Christian history has focused on placing ethical judgments upon the woman, that she was a woman deserving of the scorn of her neighbors. But the simple facts of the story don't set that out, and Jesus does not pass judgment on her. He simply states what he knows, and he knows that this woman has had five husbands, and the information isn't explained. Now, the woman's shocked response to his knowledge proclaims that she recognizes him as a prophet. So Jesus may have had insight into her story. He may have known that she was five times a widow, a tragedy that would have caused scorn towards her instead of compassion. Or Jesus might have seen that she had been repeatedly abused and discarded by divorce by a succession of men, because they could do that just by saying the words. Also, a reason to be compassionate towards her rather than judgmental. Now, the woman is clearly shocked with the revelation that Jesus knows of her painful past, but she offers no further personal information, and she tries to get back onto safer ground by talking about theology and history again. She talks about the proper place of worship, that her ancestors worshiped on the mountain where they stood by the well of their ancestor Jacob, and that the Jews insisted on proper worship only being at the temple in Jerusalem. This gives Jesus the opportunity then to give her a sermon about the coming time when the place of worship would no longer matter. Rather, that people who believe would have the freedom to worship God, the Father, in spirit and in truth. And this part of the story ends with the woman saying that she understood that the Messiah was said to be coming, and Jesus discloses himself as that Messiah speaking with her. 
The story ends with the woman becoming the first non-Jewish evangelist. She returns to the community, a changed person, proclaiming the Messiah, that the Messiah is in the town. And she wants to share this amazing news with a group of neighbors and family who may have shunned her and dismissed her, but they don't dismiss this person. So we also witness the return and shock of the other disciples who see, see the end of the one-on-one -on -one conversation between Jesus and the woman. So they were witnesses to some of the social rules that Jesus broke in the story. When the woman returns at the end of the story with her community, they implore Jesus and the disciples to stay with them. They start to have deeper insight into the profound impact of the broken rules that transformed a woman's life and the life of her whole community. We are all the Samaritan woman. And all our church communities are the Samaritan town. Jesus simply slices through social norms that keep people apart. And Jesus still creates space for healing and transformation to take place. This is why our United Church of Canada has marked its place in the world right now as a church practicing deep spirituality, bold discipleship, daring justice. And the vision of the United Church of Canada is called by God as disciples of Jesus the United Church of Canada seeks to be a bold, connected, evolving church of diverse, courageous, hope-filled communities united in deep spirituality, inspiring worship, and daring justice. Now, can you recognize the alignment of our denomination's vision with St. Andrew's own mission and vision statements? So friends, you've been on the right track of discipleship for some time, and with intentional practices of discipleship, there comes spaciousness and room for the Holy Spirit to work. The story of the Samaritan woman at the well and her encounter with Jesus shows us that your path of discipleship that has led us to today, and your path of discipleship will lead you into your future. Jesus broke all the rules and created a healing space that transformed this woman's life and gave her a taste of Jesus' living water, inspiring and exciting her so much that she simply had to share that living water with her community. So friends, this is why we do the hard work of becoming an anti-racist church. We follow Jesus into those hard conversations that are necessary to break down all of the unwritten rules, the white privilege, the unconscious bias, the microaggressions that keep the living waters of Jesus' message from flowing through all of our sacred spaces and in all of our spaces of our lives. And the more we accept our own discomfort, which really is telling us that we have a need for transformation, the more space we create for Jesus' living water to flow through us. And this is why we do the hard work of reconciliation with First Nations. We follow Jesus into those hard and uncomfortable conversations, learning about the tragedy and painful legacy of the residential schools and of settler contact overall. We allow Jesus to see and name all those places that need healing so that there is space created in our souls to heal ourselves. And so we can heal our relationships with the First Peoples and with all our relations, the water and the trees and the earth so that we can walk with First Peoples together in a good way. And this is why this faith family has stepped into the courageous path of becoming an affirming congregation after discussing it for a decade. 
You will be following Jesus into those hard and uncomfortable and illuminating conversations where you will be witness to the stories that gender diverse persons and persons expressing God's amazing array of sexual orientations and expressions have to share. Your eyes and your hearts will be expanded as you recognize and heal the places of homophobia and transphobia that have built unseen rules in our lives and that Jesus will help break down and break through. Friends, I've been blessed to be a part of your early conversations with Jesus in these areas. I've already witnessed some subtle shifts in the culture of your faith family, where Jesus' living waters are flowing freely. Our intentional interim work built on the good work of your history, of your depth of care and community, and your passion to care for your neighbors in Markham and around the world. This intentional interim work has helped you take the next step, and Reverend Deborah will help you take the next step in creating ever more spaciousness and grace using your creativity and your courage as you take each new step. Together we've done hard work these past two years. While the world was shut down because it was no longer safe to gather, and we gathered as best we could in spite of our limitations. And we gathered across four provinces and two time zones. We connected and we had theological conversations. We went deeper into our faith story for ourselves and for this faith family. And coming out of the pandemic, your community has recognized the hurts that have marked us all and our neighbors. And we see evidence of God, Jesus healing living waters that are flowing in this community. It's been a good two years of this church's very long faith story. So friends, thank you for inviting me and my colleague and my friend, Reverend Tim, on this journey. A pandemic and a journey into your faith story these past 24 months. And I leave you now but I know that with Reverend Deborah's care, you will keep on meeting Jesus at the well and allowing him to lead your faith family into hard conversations that will heal and strengthen and invite others to join you in being a safe healing space of transformation right here on Main Street in Markham. Friends, may it be so. Amen. See, this is what happens when your minister preaches, one of your minister preaches, <laughs> and it's, our last ch- it's my last chance to have a kick at the can. I keep you late. So if you have to leave, please go with... Uh, our blessings, but we are going to carry on <laughs> with, with our service as we sing My Love Colors Outside the Lines.
In the midst of our worship, we come bringing our offerings, our gifts, the things which we recognize God has blessed us with that we can share and grow in strength and faith with others. And I'd like to thank all for their continuing support of St. Andrew's United Church in so many ways, the offerings which are still made at the doors where we come in to worship during the week through regular par givings, through your time and talents, through your, your music gifts, and through so many other ways. We celebrate all these gifts as we come together in prayer. Let us pray. You are a gracious God. You have given us abundantly from so many of the good things in the world. Lord, help us to grow in your spirit as we share those gifts with others in our community of faith in the world. Bless them with your love. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This is the time of the worship service now where we acknowledge the commitments that have been made in the past are coming to the end with Reverend Shannon and myself. And I invite Michelle to come and lead us in that litany of farewell. A church family is constantly changing. Individuals come and go in our church life. Loved ones come to the end of their lives. It is important and right that we recognize these times of endings and beginnings. On February 27th, 2022, our ministers, transition team, and Shining Waters region had a service of covenanting where we made promises to one another for the well-being of this congregation through the remainder of the intentional interim period. Today, we release all parties from those promises with gratitude, and we say farewell to Reverend Shannon Mang and Reverend Tim Dayfoot, whose terms as our intentional interim minister and volunteer associate minister come to an end. Members of the transition team, at the covenanting service, you accepted the call to work together in this community of faith as a transition team for this intentional interim time. On that day, you promised in faith and obedience to Christ to share this ministry, supporting one another in love and through your unity of spirit, inspiring all God's people here in their common ministry for Christ. You have served your community well as our transition team. Today, we release you from your leadership as our transition team, accept our deep gratitude and thanks for your leadership. We accept your gratitude and thanks, and we extend our own deep gratitude and thanks to this faith family for your support through our intentional interim process. From today on, we will no longer be your transition team, but we will continue our journey of faith with you all and with this community in so many ways. Thank you so much, and thank you, team. You guys are wonderful. Thank you. It's my turn. Today I thank St. Andrew's United Church, its members and friends for the love, the kindness and the support shown to me these past two years. I ask for your understanding and forgiveness for mistakes I have made and for expectations unmet. I'm grateful to God that so many here have graciously accepted my leadership. With deep joy, I recall the many things that we have been able to accomplish together 
in this short time. And with sadness, I also remember those things not accomplished. As I leave, I carry with me many good memories of experiences we have shared together. Today, I thank St. Andrew's United Church, its members and friends, for the love, the kindness, and the support shown to me these past one and a half years. I ask for your understanding and forgiveness for mistakes I have made and for expectations unmet. I am grateful to God that so many here have graciously accepted my leadership. With deep joy, I recall the many things that we have been able to accomplish together in this short time. And with sadness, I also remember those things not accomplished. As I leave, I carry with me many good memories of experiences we have shared together. We receive your thankfulness and we offer our genuine forgiveness for any mistakes and shortcomings. We offer our heartfelt thanks for all we have accomplished and for our renewed mission and ministry. We now acknowledge your departure from this ministry with us and we accept that you leave us as your, our intentional interim minister and volunteer associate minister. We express our gratitude for your time among us and ask for your forgiveness for our mistakes and shortcomings. Your influence in our lives will not leave us even though you depart from us now. We accept your gratitude and offer forgiveness for any mistakes or shortcomings, trusting that our time together and our parting are pleasing to our God whom we are called to serve. Do you, the members and friends of St. Andrew's United Church, now release this ministry team? Do you offer your encouragement and support to Reverend Shannon Mang and Reverend Tim Dayfoot in the next step of their faith journey? We do with God's help. Do you, Reverend Shannon Mang, release St. Andrew's United Church church faith family from turning to you and depending on you? I do, with God's help. Do you, Reverend Tim Dayfoot, release St. Andrew's United Church faith family from turning to you and depending on you? I do, with God's help. Let us pray. O oh God, whose everlasting love for us is trustworthy, help each of us to trust the future which rests in your care. The time, the time when, when we, we were, were together, together here in your name saw our laughter, our tears, our hopes and disappointments. Guide us as, as we hold close these cherished memories, but now move in new directions until that time to come when we are completely one with you and with each other. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go now, Reverend Shannon Mang and Reverend Tim Dayfoot, surrounded by our love and led by the promises of God, the presence of Jesus Christ, and the guidance of Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to go off script for just one moment. If I could ask each of you to stand and thank with your applause Reverend Shannon Mang, Reverend Tim Dayfoot, and the transition team for all their hard work. Thank you. And now I think we have a little video to share. If we can cue that up.
Thank you so much for the tribute in pictures with music. It brings back to my mind so many opportunities we have had to learn together, to get to know one another, to travel some way further along this journey of faith we all are on making in God's world. I'm going to invite all of us now to come together in the prayers of the people. Let us pray together. Loving God, we give you thanks for this place in our journey, a time when we can look back with fond memories, where we can look back with a feeling of accomplishment, where we can look back with the understanding that we have many more opportunities to continue growing in your love and in your spirit. And we give you thanks that we move forward in the confidence of your presence and your care as we meet and get to know fellow travelers in your love and in your world. Lord, we pray at this time for St. Andrew's United Church as it moves ahead in their work and in their commitment. We pray for Reverend Deb Foster, who joins St. Andrew's and goes through the wonder and the mystery of getting to know and learning the kind of support and help that each can give the other. We pray for the whole community of Markham, that they might be alert and aware of the wonderful work that can be done working together in the spirit of cooperation and consultation. We pray, O oh God, for our world, which continues to be caught up in violence and war, hatred and persecution, poverty and alienation. We pray that your justice may bring peace with fairness and equity. We pray that your truth may expose oppression and bring new life to those who suffer. We pray that your love might unite hearts long divided, reconciling those separated by conflict and prejudice. Loving God, we pray for the people of our own community who are in need, those who are lonely, those who are tired, those experiencing illness or distress, those overwhelmed by the difficulties of living in this society. And we give thanks for those who walk beside us on our journey, whose lives are to us a blessing. Hear us, O oh God, whenever we lift our prayers to you in intercession, in thanksgiving, in spiritual growth. For we pray in the name of your Lord, our Savior. Amen. And we gather all our prayers together in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, Father who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, kingdom the power and, and the glory, forever, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And we go forth singing, I, the Lord of sea and sky. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? <laughs> Oh, well. 
will make their darkness bright? Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the Before we join together in the choral commissioning, go now in peace. I want to say that after the service, I hope that everyone is able to come to the upper hall for a time of coffee and the kind of greetings that we give. But if you do have to leave early, Shannon and I will be up here at the front. We won't be in the narthex if you are making your way out of the sanctuary.
friends, as we leave today, may we be blessed with thirst that produces compassion, with living waters that restore our souls, and with hearts flowing with the healing waters that our parched world so desperately needs. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.